who magnify the Lord of glory who has saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of his works, but because of his own purpose and grace. And we are preachers of God's grace. And the reason that we have become preachers of God's grace is really the sovereign will of God. But ultimately, because we have lived lives of rebelling against God, we have become teachers of God's grace because God has shown us this favor that we don't deserve. You see that Peter denied Christ three times, and yet he became a teacher of God's grace. Now, I just want to go through a passage in the book of Hebrews, because it's a very significant passage dealing with the law and how it functions as a shadow. What's up? What's up? You want to come debate? You want to come into the court of reason and talk about the Word of God? Well, you're a man. Should we trust your word, what you just said? You're a man, should we trust what you said? See, it's a self-refuting claim there. It didn't work. It didn't really work very well for you. All right, so going back to Hebrews 10, we'd love to have a conversation with anyone. As you can tell, we genuinely love people. We genuinely love our neighbors, but we want to destroy every argument and every lofty opinion that's raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ because that's what the Bible tells us to do. So if you want to have a, a rational dialogue, we do this all the time, UNT, TWU, just got back from Scotland. So if you want to talk, we're willing to talk, but come into the court of reason and let's reason together about these things. But until then, I'm going to preach the gospel because it's the gospel that is the power of God for salvation. So, going, okay. For since the law, for since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. And so what we see whenever we study the Torah, we study the law of God, is that these sacrifices were a shadow and a picture of the greater reality of what was to come. Because ultimately, what we need is not these continual sacrifices that happen year after year by priests that are sinners, but we need the perfect sacrifice, and we're going to see that in this text, that perfect sacrifice being Christ, the Lord of glory, the Lamb of God. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. And so he's saying, if, if this worked, if this offering worked, then the offerings would have ceased. They would have stopped. There would have been no need to continue on with the offerings. They would have been offered once, and then that would have been good enough to satisfy the wrath of God. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And so the sacrifices that took place, they reminded people of sin. Why and how? How does a sacrifice of a lamb or a bull or a goat remind us of sin? Well, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And so these dying animals, the blood that was shed, was indicating that sin brings death. And that ultimately they deserve the death of the animal that uh, would die. Because we deserve death for our sins. When Adam was uh, created by God, God told Adam, the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. So sin brings death. So again, this text says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came to the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And so, ultimately, God is concerned with the heart. There are people who are going through the motions. You can read in Isaiah 1 and how God was displeased with their new moons and their sacrifices. They were going through the motions, but they weren't truly worshiping God from the heart. They had a heart issue where they weren't truly desiring God. They weren't sacrificing out of love for God and out of, out of a desire for God's mercy for their sins, recognizing their sins, but they just thought they could go through the motions, not really have their heart in the sacrifices, and God would forgive them, even though they really weren't all that concerned with the glory of God and the worship of God. And so what is going on here is that there was a body that is in Christ, this body that was prepared, Christ who created all things, who upholds the universe by the word of his power, entered in a time, born of the Virgin Mary, born under the law, obeyed all of the law of God perfectly, and he went to the cross and he died the death that you deserve and the death that I deserve because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the good news of the gospel is that today, my friends, you could be justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, through the blood that has been paid, that ransom that has been paid. All of your sins can be washed away. 
even though we all have broken God's law and sin separates us from this eternal God, there is a way of redemption in Christ. And he said, when he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And so what's going on here is that Christ is the once for all sacrifice. The sacrifice once for all. All those other sacrifices, the head tax, all the different ceremonial laws that the Jews did, they had to happen year after year after year because it was presented by sinners and the blood of bulls and goats and lambs could never truly take away sin. But the blood of the God-man, Jesus Christ, the God who became man, is of infinite value because Christ is of greater value than everything. He's the Christ who is preeminent over creation because he's the one who created the creation. He's the creator of the world. He made all things. In him and through him and are, are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so we seek to glorify God and to preach Christ crucified. No matter what the response of man is, we know that God is honored and worthy to be praised. He is the worthy lamb who was slain to receive honor and power and glory and dominion. And his blood was shed for people from all nations, tribes, and tongues. And so this message today isn't limited to you based on your ethnicity, and it's certainly not limited to how much sin you have on your record if you would just be humble and contrite and bring your sins to God. Because while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And since we are all ungodly, we all qualify for this message, my dear friends. And so Christ is the once for all sacrifice, once for all time. Not saying once for all of people, but there is no need for any other sacrifice to take place because Christ drank the cup of God's wrath. He satisfied the wrath of God for all of eternity. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Whenever Christ died, he rose again, he appeared over 500 witnesses, and he ascended and sat down at the right hand of the throne of the Father. And when he sat down, he completed the work. It satisfied the wrath of God for all of eternity. This is something that we should delight in, that we should talk to other brothers and sisters in Christ about. We should be delighting in the precious blood of Christ. Many people will claim, well, I'm a Christian, but they don't delight in the true and living God. They don't delight in the gospel being preached, even though Christ said, go out into all the world and preach the gospel that his house may be filled, to compel people to go out to the highways and byways and compel people to come in so that his wedding banquet would be filled of people who don't deserve to be there. This is the message of the cross, the message of the gospel, that it's for those who don't deserve it. It's for sinners. None of us deserve salvation. None of us deserve eternal life. But Christ offered his life as a single sacrifice for sins, and he sat down as the King of Kings. So he sat down, my friends. He is the King. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And this is why the scriptures say, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. What we see in the scriptures is that he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be defeated is death. So Christ is reigning. He's in the heavenly places. Heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. And he is working now to defeat enemies. And he's doing that by making peace by the blood of the cross. Through the reign of King Jesus, he's reconciling the world to himself, defeating enemies one by one through his rule, this reign where he has the rod of iron and he's defeating every enemy. The question is, are you going to be an enemy for the rest of your life? Or are you going to be an enemy who's been reconciled to God? Because anyone, anyone who's a Christian today was once an enemy of God who hated God and hated his gospel. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. You see, we have a need to be perfect. Why? Because Christ said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But none of us are perfect. I already said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So how is this perfection attainable? Well, it's attainable through faith in Jesus Christ, trusting in him. Because the scriptures say, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteous of God. So if you would have faith in Jesus Christ, that means that you're hiding in the righteous robes of Jesus, and that gives you access to stand in the presence of the thrice holy God, not because you're worthy, not because you're deserving, but because you're hiding in Jesus, and that way you can actually stand in the presence of the just God that you don't deserve to stand in front of. You see, because God alone is holy, he cannot look upon a single sin. And this is why the Bible says, 
For if anyone keeps the whole law but fails in one point, he's become accountable for all of it. So even if you've sinned a single time, you are guilty before God as if you've broken the entire thing. But if you're being honest, you have more sins than just one. You've lied, you've stolen, you've said God's name in vain. Consider these things, my friends. Jesus said if you've looked with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. We're living in a pornographic society that celebrates sexual sin. But it's this sin that is ultimately going to bring us to death. It's going to bring us and drag our souls to hell if we don't turn and look to the beloved Son of God. If we don't turn and look to the cross of Christ in whom we should boast in and trust in and cling to with all of our life. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. And so Christ is the final offering. He's the once for all sacrifice, as it said in verse 10. And if you've been born again, that means you have new desires. God, in His omnipotence, takes out the dead, corrupt, depraved heart. He takes that out and He puts in a new heart that has the law of God written on it. To where we go from not wanting God, living as enemies of God, to actually being reconciled to God. You see, I didn't want God whenever I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't a Christian until I was 21. I used to hate God. I used to tell God, you can't save me. You can't change me. And yet God in His mercy and His love, He did save me. He forgave me of my depravity. He forgave me of my sexual sin, my sexual lust. He forgave me of all of my drug addiction. He forgave me of all of my thievery. And now that I've been forgiven of much, I love much. And so I'm here to preach the cross. It's a nice manual there. That was really clean. It was a really clean manual you did. It was really good. So now that, I've been, now that I've been justified by the blood of Christ, I must tell you how you can be saved. You see, if the gospel, which it is, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, and because I have this gospel message, I must share this with others that you might have redemption in the blood of Christ. So be washed. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins might be as red as scarlet, God is able to make it as white as snow. Though it is red like crimson, He can make it as white as wool. So that sin debt that stands against you can be canceled and nailed to the cross if you would call upon the name of the Lord and be saved as the word of God promises. So trust in the words of the true and living God. Trust in the Christ who died for the ungodly. And I would ask you, have you come to trust in the Christ who died for the ungodly? 